Well, good morning, Midway Church. Great to see all of you here, and great to have you folks joining us online from wherever you are. Really, I'm glad to be back in the house, and glad to have you here uh, for this last little quarter of our last couple of months, actually. We're already in the last quarter of the year, two months left in the year 2023. Man, seems like just yesterday we're beginning uh, the year 2000, and scared to death that the world was going to shut down. And all the computers weren't going to work in this thing called Y2K, for those of us who are old enough. Time keeps on ticking. And it's just a reminder to all of us that it's going to keep on ticking. And we have one life to live, and then we move into eternity, and we stand before God to give an account for the life in which we've lived. And that's a sobering thought. We have a lot of reason today to want to be better. Uh, Do you want to be better? That's my question. Uh, Do I want to be better? Do I want to get better in my life, in my marriage, in my walk with God, in every area of life? I'm talking today about becoming a person with a high GQ. Now, I know what some of you guys are thinking. You're saying, yeah, I got it. I got it. I'm the GQ man on front page. Not that kind of GQ, all right? Um, Are you becoming a person with a high GQ? you're not, do you want to? We have a lot of reason to improve. One is the fact that we are in these last couple of months of the year. We had a lot of goals at the beginning of the year. We had these things called New Year's resolutions. Going to get better at this, that, and the other. Now we're at the end, and a lot of folks have gotten off track, and you've got an opportunity in the last couple of months to really get some things in order. You don't have to wait till January 1 to get things in order in your life. Okay. Another thing is we've got Thanksgiving just around the corner. Uh, it's a great, great time. The entire holiday season of Thanksgiving, of Christmas, and all that accompanies it, it's a great time to spend time together. And uh, I know it can be a tough time. A lot of bad things and memories. Sometimes the people are no longer there to sit around the table that one time used to sit there and we don't have the money we used to have. We don't have the job I used to have. I don't have the husband or wife I used to have or a son or daughter's passed away or I don't have the health I used to have or I don't have the hope I used to have. I don't see good about the future that I used to see. All those kind of things. I know in these seasons of Thanksgiving and holidays and along toward this, this time, the days are getting a little bit shorter. Depression can move in. There's an entire mindset, if you're not careful, will seep into your life. I understand it. I get it. I've had more deaths happen in my own family in November and December than any other two months of the year. My my father, my mother, my brother, a grandmother, two grandparents, one died on Christmas Eve, another two days after Christmas, this entire season. But that's not my focus. I know where they are. The Bible has this promise of those who know Jesus Christ going to heaven someday. My father used to remind us, and I've heard him say it many times, uh, when bad things would happen in this world, I know it's just another reminder, there is a heaven, and this ain't it. But someday we're going there, and it's going to be a good day. Old songs written about a glad reunion day where we gather together again. And I want to challenge you to focus on that. And while we have this time right now in our life, focus on getting better. There's another thing happening in this world. We've seen a lot of chaos and war. We've got conflict going on in the Middle East. Again, don't think it's going away, even though we have a little times of peace uh, come in and wars and conflicts subside for a while. I've never in my life, in my lifetime, I haven't seen open declaration and seemingly cheering support for a group who has gone in and beheaded people. I haven't seen that in my lifetime, but we're now seeing that and people choosing sides, and many of them are on our streets now choosing sides with those who've done that in many cases. It's a startling time. It's a little bit, can be a little bit unnerving. Uh, But here's what we know as believers. Let me remind you. The Bible tells us that Jerusalem... And the Jews and Israel 
play a major part regarding the signs of when the Lord Jesus is coming back. And when you find one little spot in the world like that, that keeps showing up on the news every single day of your life, <laughs> it makes me want you to go outside and look up every now and then and say, Lord, could it be today? So as believers, we have so much to be hopeful for, even in the midst of a world of chaos. Now, my, my real focus this morning, all of that are reasons why we should want to get better. We don't know how much longer we've got in this world. I want to finish well. That's one of our principles of ILI, of the International Leadership Institute. It's about integrity and finishing well. It's not only important to start well, but to finish well. And I want to finish well. Many of you are young in this in this, in this room today, and this is when many of our younger generation comes along mixed with us who are in the older generation, but I'm telling you, I know you want to get started well, but it's going to be something you have to fight until the day that you die. When you get married, you want to marry well, and you're going to have to work with your marriage until the day that you die, and God takes you home. You're never going to be able to put it on cruise control, and so let's choose to get better today. Let's talk about gratitude, the power of gratitude. First of all, I want to read a passage in Luke chapter 17. Turn to me to Luke chapter 17, and let's dive in to this story of gratitude. If you want to take a little time this week, I'll give you an outline for the chapter. The chapter of Luke 17 is verse 1 through 6 is all about forgiveness, these are, these are four really good ones in this chapter. It's all about forgiveness, verse 1 through 6. Verse 7 through 10 is all about faithfulness. Verse 11 through 19 is all about thankfulness. And verse 20 through 37 is all about preparedness, getting prepared for the Lord's return. All of those will help all of us get better. We're going to hone in beginning in verse 11, Luke 17, and talk about thankfulness or gratitude. You ready for the word? Say, I am. Here it is. While traveling to Jerusalem, he passed between, he, Jesus, passed between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, 10 men with serious skin diseases met him. They stood at a distance and raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he told them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And while they were going, they were healed. Did you get that? And while they were going, they were healed. Jesus healed people in a variety of ways. Sometimes he touched them. Sometimes he asked them to do things. This time he doesn't even touch them. He just says, go present yourselves to the priest. Go show yourself to the priest. And they were healed as they were going. They took steps of faith and they were healed. Verse 15. But one of them, seeing that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice gave glory to God. He fell face down at his feet, thanking him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus said, were not 10 cleansed? Moment of silence. Where are the nine? Moment of silence. Did any return to give glory to God except this foreigner? This Samaritan, this non-Jewish person, this person who's been alienated not only because of leprosy, but also because of their, their culture, because of their ethnicity. And he told, told him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. That's a very weak translation in this translation of the Greek. It is better translation, your faith has saved you. He's already been made well because of the healing of Jesus, but his faith now has saved him, all right? He is well spiritually now in addition to physically. It's a great story. Jesus is on his final journey from northern Israel and Galilee down to Jerusalem, and he's headed to the cross. We know this. Because in Luke chapter 9, in verse 51, it tells us that he began on that journey. As a matter of fact, in Luke 9, 51, 10 chapters earlier, it says, when the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. Now, in that same chapter, Luke chapter 9, we know he was near Caesarea Philippi, because it's there that he 
asked Peter, who do people say that I am? And Peter said, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. And he said, well, who do you say that I am? And he said, I, I, I believe you're the Christ, the son of the living God. I've been there to Caesarea Philippi. It's up near the wilderness of Dan. It's about as far as you can get and still be in Israel without getting into Syria or Lebanon. And somewhere near that region, he says he senses that it's time to go on his last journey. He has one journey left. Now, He's in his early 30s. He's made this journey from the northern region of Israel down to Jerusalem many, many times. As a matter of fact, as a Jewish person, a faithful Jewish person, he would have made that trip many times, sometimes several in a year, to go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices or to worship and to be a part of that process there in Jerusalem. So he's walked that journey many, many times, and this is the last time he's going this way and so everything that you find between chapter 9 and all the way into Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, all of those events happen while he's got it on his mind, I'm going to the cross. Now, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, he actually arrives in Jerusalem, and it says here, as he approached and saw the city, he wept over it. That's the heart and mindset that he has as he walks in the city of Jerusalem for his final time. But somewhere in the middle of all of that, he comes into a Samaritan city, and there are 10 lepers. Now, not all of them are Samaritans. Some of them, no doubt, are Jewish people who've also got leprosy. You see, one thing, there's one thing that would break down all the racial barriers of the day, and that's having the same disease that made you an outcast in all of society. <laughs> And even if you go back into the Old Testament scripture, it, it was such an unclean thing to have leprosy that if you thought you had been healed or cleansed or your leprosy had gone away, which was a rare thing, you had to go before the priest and the priest had to look at the scales and your skin and the circumstances and symptoms on your body, had to look at the color of your hair in those sores and in those scabs and scales. They had to look at your clothes. They had to look at the tone of your skin. And it took a long period of time for them to be declared this person had leprosy, but now they are clean. They've been healed. They have nothing wrong with them anymore. And even the clothes they were wearing had to go through a ceremonial process to be cleansed lest there be some infection or bacteria inside that clothing that would cause it to spread to someone else. So if someone had leprosy, they were put as an outcast in society and they were labeled as unclean. And if they saw anyone coming near them, it was their responsibility to, to, to yell out about themselves, unclean, unclean, unclean. And people would shrink back in fear. That's the lifestyle that these 10 men have been living for some period of time. And Jesus walks into the city and these 10 men come to Jesus with a different mindset. And instead of just crying out, unclean, 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 they say, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And they see something different in him that they've never seen in anyone else. And all Jesus says he didn't ask him to do any tricks. He didn't ask him to repeat anything. He didn't breathe on them. He didn't lay hands on them. In this case, he just had a unique thing. He said, go present yourself to the priest. Well, that is a very redundant journey if you don't believe you're healed or going to be healed. <laughs> It is a true step of faith for them to turn away and walk away to go present themselves to the priest because they're going to the priest so the priest can check them off and say they are clean. They've been cleansed and healed from their leprosy. And it says, as they were going, they were healed. Wow, how powerful is that? <laughs> Verse 15, but one of them, seeing that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice gave glory to God. He fell down at his feet, thanking him, and he was a Samaritan. I love that. And then Jesus asked these three basic questions. 
We train our leaders. We train our life group leaders. We train our people in sharing their faith or teachers who are leading our people in discipleship. Don't be, try to, listen to me carefully. Don't try to become an expert in theology. Number one, you're not. We never do. The more you're going to know about God, the more questions you're going to find you have. <laughs> I've been at this for 40 years diligently, and sometimes I have deeper questions and more questions a day than I had. I had a lot figured out when I started. But the longer I'm at it, the dumber I get, if you know what I mean. I realize how much I don't know. I'm not saying don't study. Study all again. Learn all the views. But don't be so prideful and arrogant about your knowledge because the average person needs to think. They have to be on a journey, and Jesus understood that. So he didn't come and just spout out information. He brings them together, and he just asks a couple of simple questions, life group leader. He says, weren't there 10 who got healed? And he shuts up. Life group leader, that's our training. You should spend over half your time as a life group leader formulating your questions. If you ask good questions, the growth of your life group will take care of itself. And then he says, um, where are the nine? He stops talking. Just with those two questions, I promise you the, the, the crowd who's gathered, they know exactly what he's saying without uttering a paragraph to explain it. Weren't there 10? Where are the nine? You mean only this foreigner is the one who came back to say thank you? This Samaritan, another major message in that question. You see, gratitude is so powerful in our life. How grateful how often, how well, how effective are you at demonstrating gratitude? How consistent are you at demonstrating, showing, saying gratitude? How disciplined are you as a parent are you at training your children to show gratitude? Second thing I want to talk about for a second is the potential of gratitude. Um, there's three things I want to mention here. One of them you're going to be very familiar. One, not quite as much, and the other, very little at all. First one is IQ. IQ. I said I, I want to talk to you about becoming a person with a high GQ. We all are familiar with IQ. It stands for intelligence Quotient, okay? Quotient is just simply the amount of a specified characteristic. So how much intelligence do you have? That's what that IQ is. What's your amount of characteristic of intelligence? On average, in the United States, it's 98 on a test, IQ test. 98 is the average. Now, most of us are likely a little below average. Okay? We have some fairly highly intellectual people here, but in the United States, we're told that 68% of people are between 85 and 115. 68%. That's where most of us are going to fall, 85 to 115. Most of you valedictorians and people along that line, salutatorians, and most of them are going to be in that upper range on that average. They're not geniuses per se, but they're going to be on the upper range. Some of you married well. Okay. <laughs> But IQ, scientists really differ and research differs some on this, but there's a fairly good assumption and agreement that a large portion of our, of our IQ is genetic. We're born with it. 
We're born with a large portion of our IQ, our intelligence capacity, our, our ability to, to dive into intricate technical issues or mathematics and theories and it requires a lot of just natural memory and things that once your brain absorbs it, it can retain it and pull it back and tie it in with other things it learns later on through life. And all of that is combined to create what we call an IQ, a person's capacity to demonstrate high levels of intelligence. But a large portion of that you're born with means you have zero choice on a large portion of that. 50 to 80%, it is said, you are born with your amount of IQ. 60 to 80% of it. About 20% of it, you're going to have to discipline yourself and learn and buckle down and, and you can expand what God's given you. You all right? Through your environment, through your culture, through investment, through opportunity, through opportunity that people give to you or your parents give to you early in life. So IQ. There's a, there's a second, it's called EQ, EQ. A little more focus on that in the last, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years, EQ. It it's, it's refers to either emotional quotient or empathy quotient. Empathy is one of the com key components of having a high EQ. It is an ability to relate to people, to empathize with people, to connect relationally, to have relationships. And oftentimes, you'll find high IQ and EQ conflicting. Sometimes people who are extremely, if they score 140, 50, 60, 70, and even on up to maybe two or 300 in IQ, oftentimes, those people in society, they'll use the term, that person's just a little weird. What that means is, oftentimes, that person is a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> they have such a higher intellectual capacity than I have, but sometimes they may struggle a little bit with relationships, which may come more natural for you. And so they may can deal with equations and go through calculus and physics, and like it's a breeze, and you're sitting there, I can't do this. They may be in relationship with people, and they're just breezing through calculus and they look at a relationship and they're saying, I can't do this. It's two ends, two different parts of the world. Now we're told that EQ, about 10% of our EQ level is we're born with, it's genetic. And about 80 to 90% of it is conditional and environmental and deals with opportunities we have in life and events that we experience in this world and life and whether it shuts us down emotionally or encourages us, makes us laugh or cry, feel good, feel bad, all those kind of things. But about 80, 90% of our life emotionally is all about that. Now, I wanna be very honest with you. I am, I don't have, I've never taken a test, but I can tell you by, by historic fact, I do not have a high IQ. I promise you, I do not have a very high IQ at all. Um, uh, most of my technical professors, they, after about three days, I'm sure they scratch their head and say, son, what are you doing in here? <laughs> You're not going to make it in this class. I wanted to be an engineer. And I looked and I thought, well, calculus and trig and geometry and physics and all that. It intrigued me, but I'd only read about it in Compton's Encyclopedia, which is my version of Google growing up. And I would read about some of that stuff and I thought, I'll learn that someday. But I got in and started learning that. I never passed, to this day, college algebra one. I did great adding numbers. But when they made me add letters, it didn't make sense to me. And I never have gotten it, okay? <laughs> I didn't have the intellectual quotient capacity to add letters and, and, and to say, well, this represents this, and this represents, I forget what I'm representing, and I, I just couldn't get it all right, and I finally just gave up on all that, and it was God's way of channeling me to say, son, I didn't create you to be an engineer. i got people for that. They've got a high IQ. You're not one of them. I'm sorry, son, but I'm, I'm going to give you a high EQ. Y'all all right? I'm going to give you a high EQ. I'm going to make you a smiler, and people are going to like you. I don't make it, you, you, you're so intimidated and you don't have the ability to get up and hardly say good morning to your mama, but I don't make it where you can get up and speak to thousands. They're going to enjoy it. Now, I was born with about 10 or 20% of that, but the rest of it, I've had to work mighty diligently to develop it. 
to keep saying hello. Now, some of you wonder. Now, I've tried, I've introduced myself to the pastor seven times. And when I walk up, he still calls me Bud or Sis. <laughs> That's because I don't have a high IQ. My long-term memory is not much. I, I'll be honest with you. I have to write stuff down. I, I write my sermon outlines on Sunday morning. I've been getting up at 3 a.m. for 40 years on Sunday mornings. And I write my sermon outline. I wrote every bit of that this morning, all right? All my notes. Little, little note joggers right there. Now, I, I, I study. I, I'm, I'm not slothful. I'm not lazy. I, I read throughout the week. I read commentaries throughout the week. I read my Bible throughout the week. I write notes down. I may even have some outline. I wrote my entire outline yesterday while I watched the Georgia Bulldogs win. And I'm supposed to congratulate Georgia Tech people and Auburn people because you don't get much of that. Okay. <laughs> But as I was sitting there watching Georgia play, I, I'm, I'm, I'm studying about EQ and IQ and all of that, and, and all this just started coming together and clicking. I didn't have all of those concepts together until yesterday. I wrote it all out this morning, and here I am. It, why do I do that? I do that because if I write it yesterday and don't rewrite it today, I don't know what I wrote, and I can't get up here and preach it to you because I don't have the high IQ. I don't have great collective memory about things. I rely on systems and people to help me and people around me to shore me up, to make me look like a decent human in some of those areas that I'm slack in. But I'm a smiler, and I can hug your neck. And God said, I'm going to help that boy. <laughs> it's called EQ, and I can feel with you. I can hurt with you. I can laugh with you. And I, I can try my best to understand you. I'll try hard to put myself in your position. I, I know I can't totally, but I'm telling you, I, I will try. That's why, one reason I, I don't counsel hardly ever. We have uh, counseling and people that, that will help you. And if you need counseling, if you marriage, anything under the sun, we cover it, pay for it. doesn't cost you a dime. It's one of the services of our church. We do it for people inside our church and outside our church. We're here to serve our community. But I'm not the guy. Sometimes we have people, but I, I just, I, I insist, I want to meet with Pastor Todd. I'm just telling you, you're wasting your time. And mine. I, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm too, do you want to get better? Yep, well, tell me the problem. Well, when I do this, this, and this, she does that. And it just drives everybody crazy. And I'll say, well, then stop doing this, this, and this. <laughs> well, but no, no, meeting's over. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. All right. So, but, but I, I, I try, I try I, to empathize. We have this, uh, about 10% of that is, is you're born with, other 80, 90, you're going to develop EQ. You can learn how to be nice. That's my point. Y'all okay? You can learn how to smile. You can learn how to say hello, goodbye. You can learn how to say thank you. I appreciate that. That leads me to number three here. GQ. You may dream and say, oh man, I wish I had a great high, high IQ. I wish I was better with people. Well, you can be. If you don't have a high IQ, can't help you. But on EQ, I can help you. GQ, I can really help you. GQ is gratitude quotient. How much of that do you have? Now, if you have that, I want to say, go on record and say, you were not born with any of that. <laughs> you were not born with any essence of GQ. Gratitude quotient. And let me tell you how I know. Because you were born with a sinful nature that works against every sense of gratitude you will ever express. You were born with a sinful nature that drives you to make you number one in everything. Your sinful nature wants to make the whole world about you, life about you, and every issue that you face, you're going to be right in every case, and everybody else is wrong in every case, and you don't see a reason to ever show gratitude because you deserve it anyway. 
You didn't put you here. God put you here. Your parents brought you here. Your teachers brought you here. Your somebody brought you here. They're responsible for me being here. So they should be the ones to take care of me and give and serve and provide and everyone. And we have an entire society now that we're nurturing to be ingrates. who never see a reason to say, to humble themselves before the mighty hand of God at this, as this man did, fell prostrate before Jesus and said, Lord, thank you for being merciful to me. And he demonstrated genuine gratitude to the Lord Jesus for healing him. He both said it and demonstrated it with his life, behavior. Now, in GQ, I said it's 100% your choice. It's a learned behavior. There are four ABCDs. Let me give you the ABCs of gratitude if you want to know how to do it. Number one is attitude. You choose. It's an attitude. It's an attitude. Number two, it's a behavior. It's an action. Number three, it's a choice that you're going to make every time. And you can make it or not make it. And finally, D is for discipline. A, B, C, D. Attitude, behavior, choice, discipline. And the most grateful people around are the ones who've gone through that process. They've said, I want to be a grateful person. I want the impact of what gratitude does in my life. I'm going to let it be my behavior. I'm choosing that, and I'm going to make it a regular discipline of my life every single time. I'm going to say thank you. Uh, I don't know why we don't teach our kids more about gratitude. I mean, I even teach my dog gratitude. I teach Squeak gratitude. I got a dog named Squeak. And I, if she trees me raccoons in a night, I believe she knows the difference. If she trees me raccoons, she gets treats when we get back to the dog pen. I have, I have liver treats for my dog. 2 a.m. in the morning, she trees raccoons, she goes in with a whole different action. That tells she's twisting all over. Why? Because I'm going to show her gratitude for good behavior. Gratitude, and I give her to it. If she don't treat me raccoons, she goes to bed without snack. That's right. You say she know the difference. She was number one in Georgia two years ago. I believe she does. Friends, it makes a lot of difference. Let me give you a thought here. Is it is it really that big a deal to be grateful or ungrateful? Is it really that big a deal? Turn with me to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. I'm going to spend a little time here. I'll speed up toward the end of the message here for some practical things, but I want you to grasp this. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. There we go. Here's what it says. For though they knew God, or, or, I'm sorry, I'll begin to verse 21. Verse 20. From the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, speaking about God's, that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. It's a huge passage for a lot of, a lot of things. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show, what's that word? Gratitude or show thanks. Because they didn't show thanks. They showed no gratitude, even though they knew God existed. They didn't show him, worship him as God, or show him gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over to the cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served something uh, created instead of the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This is why. What is why? Because they didn't show gratitude and they didn't worship God as God. This is why God delivered them over in degrading passions, for even their females exchanged natural sexual intercourse for 
what is unnatural. The males in the same way also left natural sexual intercourse with females and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty for their perversions. And because they did not think it worthwhile to have God in their knowledge, God delivered them over to a worthless mind to do what is morally wrong. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed. Now, I know you always just quoted that for homosexuality. But how about the good old Baptist challenge of greed? And wickedness, they are full of envy. Oh, there's another one that affects us in this room who are here every week. They got a new car, why can't I get one? Their kids are doing good and why aren't mine? And wickedness, they are full of envy, murder, disputes. I think sort of outside of uh, Congress, nationwide churches are probably known for more of disputes than any other institution in the nation publicly. Y'all all right? Deceit and malice, they are, what's that word? Gossips, oh my. I told you, we're gonna be under such much conviction by the time these five weeks is up. Slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, and boastful, even got them specifically for the pastor and deacons. Inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, got them for the kids. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful, no mercy for anyone. All of that, all of that can be traced back to Romans 1 verse 21 that says specifically all of that happened because when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show Gratitude. Did you know that in, look at this quote, ingratitude, ingratitude is the basic gateway for your entire moral compass to go haywire. If you can teach your children to be extremely filled with gratitude and thanksgiving when they're young, it even helps protect their moral compass to be more on target and to guide and lead them in the right directions. It all begins with ingratitude. So I ask you again, how grateful are you? How consistent are you at showing gratitude? Saying to your wife, saying to your husband, honey, thank you for working all day. Th honey, thank you for the meal you cooked. Honey, thank you for cleaning the house. Thank, thank you for my clean underwear. <laughs> you say, yeah, but you don't know my wife. You don't know my husband. I got a long list. They, they obviously did something right, or you saw something. I mean, you married them and looked all goo-goo-eyed in their face when you did. And at that point, they were just awesome. Maybe part of their problem is maybe you rubbed off on them. I don't know. <laughs> you brought out the worst instead of the best. But I promise you, even at the worst, there's some good stuff. And there are some sacrifices and we need to hear it every now and then from one another. Let me give you the language of gratitude. Language of gratitude. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15 and 16 divides up the language of gratitude. Number one, speak words of gratitude. And number two, show actions or deeds of gratitude. Let's look at this verse. Therefore, through him, Jesus, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our, come on, the fruit of our lips that confess his name. So he's saying verbalize gratitude. Tell God gratitude. Tell others gratitude. Let words of gratitude flow from your lips as a continual sacrifice from your life. But it's not just words. requires tangible action in our life. Next verse. Therefore, don't neglect to do good and to 
share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. He's talking about giving. He's talking about generosity. He's talking about, instead of saying to the waitress, you did a great job today, sweetie. How about putting a 10 right in there? That that says that you did a good job. Y'all all right? You you ever notice sometimes you have lunch with some people. There's certain people I had someone just recently. They have made millions. If I, if I gave you their name, two thirds of this room would recognize the name and they've made millions in their lifetime. And nearly every time they're eating with somebody and it comes time for the check, they have to get up and go to the bathroom and they can't find their wallet. You ever notice how, what a habit that is for some people? Mooch. <laughs> Thank you. I sure do appreciate that. I'm really grateful for you see in many cases I want to say that words are cheap and we need to give something or do something to help demonstrate our gratitude I'll finish with this this is very very practical here I'm going to breeze through them number four the recipients of gratitude the recipients of gratitude number one the people who serve us And it's not to say everything deserves a tip. My goodness, we don't give tips for everything. You get paid to do certain things, but but don't be afraid to. And certainly don't be afraid to say, man, I really appreciate the job y'all did. Thank you for how you cleaned up around here when you got finished with your your job. You guys do an amazing job. I'm gonna recommend you such and such. Even the book of Proverbs says, if it's in your power to bless someone, do not withhold it. Did you get that? How many people that with the, with the power of their word, a person could get a job somewhere? You know, I, I don't know if I'm going to get my reputation out there. Well, you've been sorry as dirt yourself at times. <laughs> well, why not? Give them a chance. If they burn you a couple of times, well, then you can hold back a little bit. But until then, give them a chance. Put your word out there. Yeah, I think they'll do you a great job. People who serve us. Number two, the people who invest in us. My goodness, I've got a long list of people who've invested in me. I see Mike Corian back there. Ninth grade, teaching me how to weld. Teaching me how to run a milling machine. That's where I'd start dreaming about being an engineer. I could do all that mechanical stuff. I just couldn't do all that brain stuff. (laughs) Teachers, pastors, leaders, Friends, people who've just been a blessing. The people who invest in us. The people, number three, the people who bless us. If somebody's just a blessing in your life, it could be a mentor, it could be a, a grandmother or an aunt or a neighbor who invested at times or spent time with you. The older I get, I realize what a burden I must have been to some older men who invested in me. Their life would have been a whole lot easier if they'd have left me behind, but they invited me to go hunting or to go rabbit hunting or deer hunting or or coon hunting or fishing. And they're dealing with a a 12-year-old boy that's aggravating and a boy. And these men are 50s and 60s and 70s. And I'm thinking, man... Number four, the people who employ us. Employees, if you work for somebody, say good stuff about your employer or just don't say anything at all and keep working. And if you don't like what you're doing or how they're treating you, go somewhere else. They're helping provide for your family. Give your best there. Be grateful. Be a blessing to the company, to the people there, to the employees that you're working around. Work together. Number five is the people who work for us. Um, If we are the owners or the managers of a company or we lead a team, bless the people who work for you. Say thank you to the people who work for you. They're not just there to make you rich. It's understandable. You're going to make a lot more than what they do. 
but treat them well. And if they're worthy of good hire, you're tired of heavy turnover, pay them something decent. People will stay somewhere that they enjoy and are making a good living. And if you're making a massive living and they're not, don't get frustrated because you keep having turnover. There's a lot of ways you can do that. And also just uh, some people don't need all the money. They just love to be appreciated. So gratitude, whether you're the employee or the employee, goes a long way if we share that. It's a powerful thing. Number six, the people who raise us. And the people who raise us could be parents. It could be surrogate parents, adoptive parents who just invest in us. Number seven, it's not about the people. It's about God, ultimately. God who created us. He wants to be center number one in your life, period. And so many of us who claim to be Christian won't give him a dime to anything, to help anybody. You say, oh, how do we do that? Well, Jesus talked about you by saying, when you've given it to one of the least of these who are in prison, who are hurting, who are in need, or who are hungry, or who are unclothed, you've given it unto me. That's what our entire church is about. That's the family that we're a part of. We do ministry through our family. We feed about 350 families every week. We gave away some 2,000 jackets to kids and parents this week getting ready for winter time in our area. You say, well, I'm not one of those people, but a lot of people out there do. How many, people, how many grandparents are raising kids right now? What a challenge. The inflation, our credit cards are rising we wonder what's going to happen. I don't know. But I'll tell you this. One of the keys to surviving it all is to go through the journey with deep gratitude. Because I, I don't care how bad things are. There's a whole lot to be grateful for. Practical application. Here it is. I'm going to give you this is very, very quick. It's something I'm going to challenge you to do the next, for the next week. Number one, I want you to get up in the mornings. I want you to do this tangibly. Get up in, your mor in the morning before you cut on the television, before you make the coffee, put on breakfast, do anything. I want you to walk outside on your porch or out in front of your house and just look up in the sky. I don't care if it's dark, five in the morning or sun's already risen. Look up into the heavens. And it's important you go outside. There's something significant. Just go out and stand for a second. It's gonna make you feel really small when you get outside your house. You're big in your house. You get outside, man, I'm just a small little minute detail. And just look up. Say, man, God, thank you for another day. Thank you for today. Don't know what today holds, but I know who holds it. He just wants you to know I'm all yours. This day's yours. I give my life to you today. Use me for your kingdom. I'm just grateful to be alive. Thank you. Thank you for how good you are to me. Breathe real deeply. That's something a lot of people can't do. Thank you for that. Go back in and get started. About lunchtime, you get ready to have your meal, stop and say, God, thank you for today. Thank you for the food. That evening before you go to bed, look out there once again and just say, God, thank you. Today's been a good day. You can reflect through the day. Been some challenges, hardships, difficulties. You'll be reminded to pray for certain individuals, do different things, pause throughout your day. Some of you, in addition to that, for seven days, you need to sit down with a card or you need to sit down with a pad, write a few names out of people who's been a blessing in your life and write a note or two. Send an email. Write a handwritten note. Make a phone call. Tell somebody what a blessing they've been in your life for investing or helping you through a hard time. Looking back at a hardship in your life and they were there, maybe they never heard you say, I know you were there. And I just want you to know, I appreciate you being there. You got people like that. I'm just telling you, this world will be a lot better place and your world will be a lot better place if you'll develop that as an attitude. You'll turn it into a behavior. You'll make it a choice for your life and allow it to become a discipline that you do. And in doing so, you become a person with a very, very high GQ. 
And I'm going to tell you, I've never seen anybody with a high GQ that I didn't love and enjoy being around. They're like magnets. Inside your bulletin, every week for the next five weeks, this is our stewardship month, you're going to see this 90-day challenge. Our church has been doing this for 27 years. We encourage, challenge people. If you've never tithed or at least become a, a giver in some form to the kingdom of God, if you'll commit to tithe for at least 90 days, if at the end of that 90 days, and this young people, I started this when I was 15. I didn't have a card. Nobody gave me a guarantee. <laughs> my dad, I earned my first paycheck, $68. He said, son, if you really want God's blessing on your life, if you want your heart protected from greed, that's what he said. You take the first tenth of that $68 and you put in the offering plate today and you do that the rest of your life. And I did that day. I wrote my first check for $6.80 and put it in the offering basket at 15. I'd worked all week bagging groceries and mopping floors. I've never stopped. I've never stopped. And it's a whole lot more. I give a whole lot more than $6.80 today. I give many times more than I made during those years, every year. And I'm blessed to be able to do so. If you want to take God at his word and I'll give for 90 days, and fill out that. If at the end of 90 days you think it was a mistake, you come and say to us privately, me or a finance team, either one, or finance leader, just an individual, not to be a group, just an individual. I believe I, I didn't do right or I'm just not going to be able to make it. I, don't, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't really need to do that. I feel like it was wrong for me. We'll give you all your money back. Everything you've given over the whole 90 days. You ain't going to miss anything. You just make the commitment. If you'll take that and fold it, these boxes at the doors on the walls over here, Drop it in those boxes, and we'll collect those. Or you can take it to any of our desks and drop it off. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, thank you for the time we've had together today studying your word. We rejoice and we celebrate. In the room, if you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, I want to invite you to a personal relationship with him. Invite him in. Pray a prayer something like this. There's no magical prayer, no exact sinner's prayer. But it's a condition of your heart. Just, Lord Jesus, today I give you me. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And as of today, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. If you've just prayed that prayer, we welcome you to the family of God and we want to be your church family and your church home to help you in that journey. In just a moment, Leslie's going to come out and she's going to share with you what to do next. We celebrate and welcome you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's thank God for his word. Thank you.